Hello and welcome to Indus News Live from Islamabad. I'm Hiramu Safa and these are the headlines. The Indian Army is planning a false operation on the pretext of fake encounter of three Kashmiri detainees. Diplomatic sources said these Kashmiri civilians are already in India, police custody at Kishtwar district occupied Kashmir. They said the false operation will be aimed at crafting fabricated stories against Pakistan. In India, tens of thousands of farmers have ended a day-long hunger strike but vowed to continue their sit-in until the government repeals the controversial farm laws. They are of the view that the new reforms will hurt their livelihood and benefit only big corporates. Eleven civilians have been killed in government airstrikes in Afghanistan's southern Kandahar province. Witnesses say women and children were among those killed after the air raid hit a residential area. The Defence Ministry said it is aware of the reports of civilian casualties and it will investigate the matter. Meanwhile, 10 Afghan soldiers have been killed in a Taliban attack in northern Kunduz province. Presidential electors are gathering in state capitals across the U.S. today to formally choose the country's 46th president. Election results show Joe Biden has won the 306 electoral votes, exceeding the necessary 270, while President Donald Trump has earned 232 votes. The global coronavirus death tally has exceeded 1.6 million, while the infections from the virus has topped 72 million. The U.S. death tally is fast approaching 300,000, while its infections have surpassed the 16 million figure. Meanwhile, in India, the COVID-19 has taken over 143,000 lives and infected more than 9.8 million people. Pakistan has registered over 2,300 new infections and 36 deaths in the last 24 hours, pushing the toll to over 8,800. And in football, Barcelona have edged past Levante 1-0 to move to 8th place in the La Liga standings. Lionel Messi was Barcelona's saviour yet again and scored the only goal of the game in the 76th minute. Well, these were the headlines. News in detail coming after the short break. Stay with us. Welcome back and now the news in detail. The Indian Army is planning a false operation on the pretext of fake encounter of three Kashmiri detainees. Diplomatic sources said, said these civilians are already in Indian police custody in occupied Kashmir. Sources said India will propagate all arrests in the Kishtwar district of the occupied valley as new. They added the confiscated weapons will also be propagated as new recovery. Sources said the false operation will be aimed at crafting fabricated stories against Pakistan. Another unprovoked Indian ceasefire violation across the line of control has wounded a 45-year-old Pakistani civilian. Pakistan military's media wing says the Indian troops deliberately targeted civilians in the Chirikot sector with mortars. This year, India has killed 27 people in over 2,000 ceasefire violations. Pakistan has repeatedly summoned Indian diplomats to register its protest over such incidents of aggression. Islamabad maintains that India is resorting to such tactics to distract world attention away from its brutalities in occupied Kashmir. 
In India, tens of thousands of farmers have ended a day-long hunger strike, but vowed to continue their sit-in until the government repeals the controversial farm laws. They're of the view that the new reforms will hurt their livelihood and benefit only big corporates. The farmer unions are holding protest rallies and sit-ins across the country for the past 19 days. Earlier, Delhi Chief Minister Erwin Kejriwal also observed the hunger strike and appealed to the central government to scrap the legislation. Eleven civilians have been killed in government airstrikes in Afghanistan's southern Gandhar province. Witnesses say women and children were among those killed after the air raid hit a residential area. Defense Ministry said it is aware of the reports of civilian casualties and it will investigate the matter. In a tweet, former President Hamid Karzai strongly condemned the airstrike that killed children. Meanwhile, 10 Afghan soldiers were killed and four others wounded in a Taliban attack in northern Kunduz province. Officials said the group's commander of border guards was among those killed. However, the Taliban claimed to have killed 17 soldiers and overrun two security checkpoints in the province. It comes a day after the Afghan government and its forces killed 65 Taliban fighters in Kandahar province. Meanwhile, the negotiating team of the Afghan government is returning to Kabul today at the end of the current round of talks. They have agreed on a 23-day break in their three-month discussions with the Taliban. The two sides agreed on a 21-article list of procedural rules for the talks. They have also finalized an initial list for the agenda of the peace negotiations. A member of the government's negotiating team, Habiba Sarabi, said, the delegation will hold consultations in Kabul to find common ground for all sides. Presidential electors are gathering in state capitals across the U.S. today to formally choose the country's 46th president. A candidate needs 270 electoral votes to become president. Election results show Joe Biden has won 306 electoral votes, exceeding the necessary 270, while President Donald Trump has earned 232 votes. Electors will cast their ballots in all 50 states. In 32 states and the District of Columbia, the laws require electors to vote for the popular vote winner. The results will be sent to Washington for being tallied in a joint session of the Congress on January 6. The electors' vote has drawn special attention as President Donald Trump has refused to concede defeat, alleging electoral fraud. The United States says it has formally removed Sudan from the list of states sponsoring terrorism after 27 years. This comes after Washington brokered a normalization of ties still between Khartoum and Tel Aviv. The U.S. Embassy in Khartoum says the congressional notification period of 45 days has lapsed and the Secretary of State has signed the notification. Sudan was put on the list in 1993 over allegations that the ousted President Umar al-Bashir was harboring militants. It has cut Sudan off from financial assistance and investment. China has asked the U.S. to stop abusing state power to crack down on foreign companies. Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin said this at a news briefing in Beijing. Wang said Beijing will continue to uphold the legitimate rights and interests of Chinese firms. Earlier, Nasdaq said it will remove the sharp shares of four Chinese construction and manufacturing companies from the indexes. Nasdaq decided in response to a U.S. order restricting the purchase of their shares. Hackers have broken into the networks of the U.S. Treasury and Commerce Departments. The FBI and the Department of Homeland Security Cyber Security Arm say they are investigating the breach. Officials say the hacking appears to be a large-scale penetration of U.S. government agencies. The hacks come less than a week after foreign hackers broke into FireEye's network stealing the company's hacking tools. The company's customers included federal, state and local governments and top global corporations. In a statement, a National Security Council spokesperson said the government is taking all necessary steps to identify and remedy any possible issues related to the situation. Meanwhile, Russian embassy in Washington has called the cyber attacks contradictory to Moscow's foreign policy principles. 
Apple says it is investigating the Westron facility in India after violence erupted at the Bangalore plant. Unidentified Indian factory workers thrashed the facility and demanded unpaid wages and better working hours. In a statement, Apple said it was dispatching additional staff and auditors to the site. It said the company's teams were in close touch with the local authorities. Police say they have arrested 149 people over the violence. Earlier in a statement, Westron said it was deeply shocked by the violence, which it blamed on unknown persons with unclear intentions. The world has recorded more than 1.6 million deaths from the coronavirus and 72 million infections so far. In the U.S., the death toll is fast approaching 300,000 with more than 16 million cases. Meanwhile, India recorded more than 27,000 new cases and 336 deaths overnight. More in the following report. The first COVID-19 vaccines have arrived in Canada with some Canadians likely to get the jab over the next 24 hours. Hospitalizations in the U.S. hit another record clocking above 100,000 for the 12th consecutive day. President-elect Joe Biden has outlined a strategy to vaccinate 100 million Americans from 50 states in the first 100 days of his administration. The necessary funding from Congress we can get most of our schools open in 100 days, but we need the help from the Congress and the funding. The first 100 days won't end the COVID-19, but meeting those goals can slow the spread, save lives, and get us back to our lives with the people we love the most. Persistently high infection rates across Europe have prompted governments from London to Athens to strengthen or maintain curbs and movement. Italy has overtaken the UK to become the nation with the highest death toll in Europe with more than 64,000 deaths. Meanwhile, things seem to be improving in Oceania. New Zealand has agreed to form a quarantine-free travel bubble with Australia in the first quarter of 2021. Cabinet has agreed in principle to establish a travel bubble with Australia we anticipate in the first quarter of 2021. Pending confirmation from the Australian Cabinet and no significant change in the circumstances of either country. Officials have been working on a range of matters and good progress has been made. South Korea reported 780 new coronavirus cases, a drop from the record daily increase of the day earlier. And as with the Prime Minister Ambrose Delamini, who tested positive for COVID-19 four weeks ago, has died at age 52. Now moving on to Pakistan, 36 people have lost their lives to COVID-19 over the past 24 hours. This takes the country's death toll to over 8,832. Health officials reported 2,362 new infections overnight. Meanwhile, more than 47,000 active COVID-19 cases have been detected in the country. The health ministry says out of over 440,000 countrywide cases, more than 384,000 people have recovered. The ministry said over 195,000 cases have been detected in the Sindh province, while Punjab has reported nearly 127,000 cases. More news stories coming up after the short break. Stay with us. Welcome back and moving on to Iran has summoned the German and French envoys over the European Union's condemnation of the hanging of a journalist. Rahul Azam was accused of provoking unrest and inspiring nationwide economic protests. State media said Iran told Ambassador hans Yudo Musel any interference in its domestic affairs was unacceptable. In a statement after the announcement of execution, the EU said it condemned the capital punishment in strongest terms. France also called the hanging a grave blow to freedom of speech in Iran. Zam's website and channel provided information on the timing of nationwide anti-government protests in 2017. In Saudi Arabia, an oil tanker of the port city of Jeddah suffered an explosion after being hit by an external source. Shipping company Hafnia said the blast caused a fire on board the B-2 
B.W. Ryan. It said no one was injured, but parts of the ship's hull were damaged. The company warned it was possible some oil leaked out from the site of the blast. Saudi Arabia did not acknowledge the attack immediately. The United Kingdom Marine Trade Operations urged ships in the area to exercise caution and said investigations were ongoing. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack. Meanwhile, the UN Security Council has voiced concerns over military escalation and food insecurity in Yemen. In a statement, the members of the council condemned the last month's Houthi attack on oil facilities in Saudi Arabia. The statement said council reiterated its commitment to an inclusive Yemeni-led and Yemeni-owned political process. It said the council also reaffirmed international community's commitment to uphold Yemen's sovereignty, unity and territorial integrity. The Security Council expressed alarm at reports showing 13.5 million Yemenis being at risk of acute starvation. The Council also emphasized the importance of facilitating humanitarian assistance to prevent the enormous loss of life. Iraq's oil ministry has managed to put out fire at one of two oil wells in the northern Khabaz oil field. In a statement, the oil ministry said efforts are underway to contain the fire at the second well. It said production from the roughly 25,000 barrel per day field has not been affected. The well were set ablaze on December 9th by explosive devices in an ISIS attack. Kuwait's Amir Sheikh Nawaf al-Ahmad has appointed a new cabinet following last month's parliamentary elections. The government's communications center announced the picks over Twitter. It says Sheikh Hamad Jabbar al-Ali al-Sabah will serve as deputy prime minister and minister of defense. The Amir appointed Mohammad Abdul Latif al-Faris as the new oil, electricity and water minister. Sheikh Ahmad Nasser al-Sabah has been reappointed as foreign minister, while Dr. Rana Abdullah Abdul Rahman al-Faris has been reappointed as minister of Public Works and Housing Affairs. In Australia, heavy rain and strong winds along the Queensland and New South Wales coastline have generated huge, sturdy waves. They washed away parts of the beach while destructive winds and rain caused widespread flooding. Byron Mayor Simon Richardson says the main beach, a popular tourist destination in New South Wales, has also but disappeared. A concrete walkway and a tree along the beach collapsed into the sea. Byron Bay is home to Hollywood a listers such as Chris Hemsworth. Meanwhile, a dog was rescued from sea foam as strong waves hammered the cold coast. The wet conditions contrast with bushfires that ravished World Heritage listed Fraser Island in Queensland a few weeks ago. Russia has successfully test-launched its heavy-lift Ankara A-5 space rocket after a six-year pause. In a statement, Roscosmos said aerospace forces carried out the launch from the state test space center. First test launched in 2014, Angara A-5 is set to replace the Proton-M as Russia's heavy-lift rocket. It can carry payloads bigger than 20 tons into orbit. Angara has, however, been dogged by manufacturing delays and technical issues. Last year, scientists discovered a defect in its engines that they said could destroy it in flight. But Russian President Vladimir Putin says the project has huge significance for national security. A Chinese space capsule bringing back the first moon rocks in more than four decades is on its way back to Earth. The mission landed on the moon earlier this month and collected about two kilograms of samples. The China National Space Administration said all systems on the orbiter returner combination are currently in good condition. The orbiter and returner will separate from each other at a point around 5,000 kilometers from Earth. The return capsule is expected to land in northern China in the Inner Mongolia region. The samples would be the first brought back since the Soviet Union's Luna 24 probe in 1976. Tourists are flocking to southern Chile to experience a total solar eclipse that will darken the skies today. It will also be visible in Argentina. More in the following report. 
it would only seem appropriate that the final eclipse in this eccentric year of 2020 will be visible only from Patagonia, nicknamed the end of the world, because it reaches the bottom of South American continent. Residents and tourists in Chile are buying special eyewear to safely view the total solar eclipse in the town of Villarica. It will turn daytime into twilight for up to two minutes and ten seconds as the moon passes in front of the sun. We have been planning this trip since the last eclipse in Vicuna on July 2, 2019. More or less 45 friends came by bus using all the health measures that I know and we are hoping to see the event tomorrow from our cabin. Parts of Chile are some of the best locations in the world to watch the astronomical events due to their clear skies. The eclipse will then cross the imposing Andes mountain range to be visible only in Argentina. A partial eclipse will be visible throughout the American continent as well as parts of southwestern Africa. Now moving on to the business stories, China's cargo transport index maintained rapid growth in November as the economy continues to recover from the pandemic. China Academy of Transportation Sciences say the index stood at 173.6, but on a year-on-year -year basis, the data shows a 2.9% decline, almost the same as that in October. The sub-index for cargo transport was 198.4, up 7.4% year-on-year last month. This is the seventh consecutive month that saw growth. Meanwhile, China's new home prices grew in November at their slowest monthly pace since March. European stocks are trading higher as market focus remains on optimism regarding the UK and EU's talk on a post-Brexit trade deal. European stock 600 has edged up more than half a percent, with bank stocks bouncing over 2.5 percent. London's FTSE 100 has edged up marginally, while Italy's FTSE MIB has added close to 1 percent. Frankfurt's DAX and the CAC 40 in Paris have also gained over half a percent. Earlier, Asian bursts traded mixed with mainland Chinese and Japanese stocks gaining, while sales cost being Hong Kong's Hang Seng shed. In football, Barcelona have edged past Levante 1-0 to move to 8th place in the La Liga standings. Lionel Messi was Barcelona's savior yet again and scored the only goal of the game in the 76th minute. Levante's goalkeeper Aitor Fernandez was in inspired from blocking attacks from Barcelona strikers, but Messi left Fernandez clueless with a strike from an angle after Frankie de Jong's assist. The fifth league win moves Barcelona to two places up the La Liga table. Barca are set to face leaders Real Sociedad in their next encounter on Wednesday. In the English Premier League, Liverpool missed out on the chance to move to the top as it drew an impressive Fulham 1-1. Bobby de Cordova raid put Fulham in the driving seat with a lead in the 25th minute of the first half. Mohamed Saleh fired a low penalty in the 79th minute to rescue Liverpool with a draw. In another league match, a desperate Arsenal suffered a 1-0 defeat at the hands of Burnley. The defeat marks the Gunners' fourth straight loss in league games for the first time since 1961. Meanwhile, Leicester City thrashed Brighton 3-0 to jump to third place in the Premier League. 24-year-old James Madison scored twice in the first half, followed by striker James Wardy sealing the win. In another competition, Crystal Palace denied lead Tottenham a win as they drew 1-1. And now it's time to have a look at the weather update across the globe.
For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus.news.